Part six, chapter three of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by Agnes Mary Clerke. Chapter three, part two. Progress of knowledge regarding the sun. What we have thus glanced at is but a fragment of the truly surprising mass of work accomplished by Bailey in the course of a variously occupied life. A rare combination of qualities fitted him for his task. Unvarying health, undisturbed equanimity, methodical habits, the power of directed and sustained thought combined to form in him an intellectual toiler of the surest though not perhaps of the highest quality he was in harness almost to the end he was destined scarcely to know the miseries of enforced idleness or of consciously failing powers in eighteen forty two he completed the laborious reduction of lalande's great catalogue undertaking at the request of the british association and was still engaged in seeing it through the press when he was attacked with what proved his last and it was probably his first serious illness he however recovered sufficiently to attend the oxford commemoration of july two eighteen forty four where an honorary degree of d c l was conferred upon him in company with airy and struve but sank rapidly after the effort and died on the thirtieth of august following at the age of seventy lamented and esteemed by all who knew him it is now time to consider his share in the promotion of solar research eclipses of the sun both ancient and modern were a specialty with him and he was fortunate in those which came under his observation such phenomena are of three kinds partial annular and total in a partial eclipse the moon instead of passing directly between us and the sun slips by as it were a little on one side thus cutting off from our sight only a portion of his surface an annular eclipse on the other hand takes place when the moon is indeed centrally interposed but falls short of the apparent size required for the entire concealment of the solar disk which consequently remains visible as a bright ring or annulus even when the obscuration is at its height in a total eclipse on the contrary the sun completely disappears behind the dark body of the moon the difference of the two latter varieties is due to the fact that the apparent diameter of the sun and moon are so nearly equal as to gain alternate preponderance one over the other through the slight periodical changes in their respective distances from the earth now on the fifteenth of may eighteen thirty six an annular eclipse was visible in the northern parts of great britain and was observed by bailey at inchbonny near jedburg it was here that he saw the phenomenon which obtained the name of bailey's beads from the notoriety conferred upon it by his vivid description when the cusps of the sun he writes were about forty degrees asunder a row of lucid points like a string of bright beads irregular in size and distance from each other suddenly formed round that part of the circumference of the moon that was about to enter on the sun's disk its formation indeed was so rapid that it presented the appearance of having been caused by the ignition of a fine train of gunpowder finally as the moon pursued her course the dark intervening spaces which at their origin had the appearance of lunar mountains in high relief and which still continued attached to the sun's border were stretched out into long black thick parallel lines joining the limbs of the sun and moon when all at once they suddenly gave way and left the circumference of the sun and moon in those points as in the rest comparatively smooth and circular and the moon perceptibly advanced on the face of the sun 
these curious appearances were not an absolute novelty weber in seventeen ninety one and von zach in eighteen twenty had seen the beads van swinden had described the belts or threads these last were moreover as bailey clearly perceived completely analogous to the black ligament which formed so troublesome a feature in the transits of venus in seventeen sixty four and seventeen sixty nine and which to the regret and confusion though no longer to the surprise of observers was renewed in that of eighteen seventy four the phenomenon is largely an effect of what is called irradiation by which a bright object seems to encroach upon a dark one but under good atmospheric and instrumental conditions it becomes inconspicuous the beads must always appear when the projected lunar edge is serrated with mountains in bailey's observation they were exaggerated and distorted by an irradiative clinging together of the limbs of sun and moon the immediate result however was powerfully to stimulate attention to solar eclipses in their physical aspect never before had an occurrence of the kind been expected so eagerly or prepared for so actively as that which was total over central and southern europe on the eighth of july eighteen forty two astronomers hastened from all quarters to the favoured region the astronomer royal airy repaired to turin bailey to pavia otto struve threw aside his work amidst the stars at polkoa and went south as far as Lipitz. schumacher travelled from altona to vienna arago from paris to perpignan nor did their trouble go unrewarded the expectations of the most sanguine were outdone by the wonders disclosed bailey to whose narrative we again have recourse had set up his dolens achromatic in an upper room of the university of pavia and was eagerly engaged in noting a partial repetition of the singular appearances seen by him in eighteen thirty six when he was astounded by a tremendous burst of applause from the streets below and at the same moment was electrified at the sight of one of the most brilliant and splendid phenomena that can well be imagined for at that instant the dark body of the moon was suddenly surrounded with a corona or kind of bright glory similar in shape and relative magnitude to that which painters draw round the heads of saints and which by the french is designated an aureola pavia contains many thousand inhabitants the major part of whom were at this early hour walking about the streets and squares or looking out of windows in order to witness this long talked of phenomenon and when the total obscuration took place which was instantaneous there was a universal shout from every observer which made the welkin ring and for the moment withdrew my attention from the object with which i was immediately occupied i had indeed anticipated the appearance of a luminous circle round the moon during the time of total obscurity but i did not expect from any of the accounts of preceding eclipses that i had read to witness so magnificent an exhibition as that which took place the breadth of the corona measured from the circumference of the moon appeared to me to be nearly equal to half the moon's diameter it had the appearance of brilliant rays the light was most dense close to the border of the moon and became gradually and uniformly more attenuate as its distance therefrom increased assuming the form of diverging rays in a rectilinear line which at the extremity were more divided and of an unequal length so that in no part of the corona could i discover the regular and well-defined shape of a ring at its outer margin it appeared to me to have the sun for its centre but i have no means of taking any accurate measures for determining this point its colour was quite white not pearl colour nor yellow nor red and the rays had a vivid and flickering appearance somewhat like that which a gaslight illumination might be supposed to assume if formed into a similar shape splendid and astonishing however as this remarkable phenomenon really was and although it could not fail to call forth the admiration and applause of every beholder yet i must confess 
but there was at the same time something in its singular and wonderful appearance that was appalling and i can readily imagine that uncivilized nations may occasionally have become alarmed and terrified at such an object more especially at times when the true cause of the occurrence may have been but faintly understood and the phenomenon itself wholly unexpected but the most remarkable circumstance attending the phenomenon was the appearance of three large protuberances apparently emanating from the circumference of the moon but evidently forming a portion of the corona they had the appearance of mountains of a prodigious elevation their color was red tinged with lilac or purple perhaps the color of the peach blossom would more nearly represent it they somewhat resembled the snowy tops of the alpine mountains when colored by the rising or setting sun they resembled the alpine mountains also in another respect inasmuch as their light was perfectly steady and had none of that flickering or sparkling motion so visible in other parts of the corona all the three projections were of the same roseate cast of color and very different from the brilliant vivid white light that formed the corona but they differed from each other in magnitude the whole of these three protuberances were visible even to the last moment of total obscuration at least i never lost sight of them when looking in that direction and when the first ray of light was admitted from the sun they vanished with the corona altogether and daylight was instantaneously restored notwithstanding unfavorable weather the red flames were perceived with little less clearness and no less amazement from the superega than at pavia and were even discerned by mr airy with the naked eye their form the astronomer royal wrote was nearly that of saw teeth in the position proper for a circular saw turned round in the same direction in which the hands of a watch turn their color was a full lake red and their brilliancy greater than that of any other part of the ring the height of these extraordinary objects was estimated by arago at two minutes of arc representing at the sun's distance an actual elevation of fifty four thousand miles when carefully watched the rose flush of their illumination was perceived to fade through violet to white as the light returned the same changes in a reversed order having accompanied their first appearance their forms however during about three minutes of visibility showed no change although of so apparently unstable a character as to suggest to arago mountains on the point of crumbling into ruins through top heaviness the corona both as to figure and extent presented very different appearances at different stations this was no doubt due to varieties in atmospheric conditions at the superega for instance all details of structure seemed to have been effaced by the murky air only a comparatively feeble ring of light being seen to encircle the moon elsewhere a brilliant radiated formation was conspicuous spreading at four opposite points into four vast luminous expansions compared to feather plumes or aigrettes arago or perpignan noticed considerable irregularities in the divergent rays some appeared curved and twisted a few lay across the others in a direction almost tangential to the moon's limb the general effect being described as that of a hank of thread in disorder at lipisk where the sun stood much higher above the horizon than in italy or france the corona showed with surprising splendor its apparent extent was judged by struve to be no less than twenty-five minutes more than six times airy's estimate while the great plumes spread their radiance to three or four degrees from the dark lunar edge so dazzling was the light that many well-instructed persons denied the totality of the eclipse nor was the error without precedent although the appearances attending respectively a total and an annular eclipse are in reality wholly dissimilar
in the latter case the surviving ring of sunlight becomes so much enlarged by irradiation that the interposed dark lunar body is reduced to comparative insignificance or even invisibility mclaurin tells us that during an eclipse of this character which he observed at edinburgh in seventeen thirty seven gentlemen by no means short-sighted declared themselves unable to discern the moon upon the sun without the aid of a smoked glass and bailey who however was short-sighted could distinguish in eighteen thirty six with the naked eye no trace of the globe of purple velvet which the telescope revealed as projected upon the face of the sun moreover the diminution of light is described by him as little more than might be caused by a temporary cloud passing over the sun the birds continued in full song and one cock in particular was crowing with all his might while the annulus was forming very different were the effects of the eclipse of eighteen forty two as to which some interesting particulars were collected by arago beasts of burden he tells us paused in their labour and could by no amount of punishment be induced to move until the sun reappeared birds and beasts abandoned their food linnets were found dead in their cages even ants suspended their toil diligence horses on the other hand seemed as insensible to the phenomenon as locomotives the convolvulus and some other plants closed their leaves but those of the mimosa remained open the little light that remained was of a livid hue one observer described the general coloration as resembling the lees of wine but human faces showed pale olive or greenish we may then rest assured that none of the remarkable obscurations recorded in history were due to eclipses of the annular kind the existence of the corona is no modern discovery indeed it is too conspicuous an apparition to escape notice from the least attentive or least practised observer of a total eclipse nevertheless explicit references to it are rare in early times plutarch however speaks of a certain splendour compassing round the hidden edge of the sun as a regular feature of total eclipses and the corona is expressly mentioned in a description of an eclipse visible at corfu in 968 a d the first to take the phenomenon into scientific consideration was kepler he showed from the orbital positions at the time of the sun and moon that an eclipse observed by clavius at rome in 1567 could not have been annular as the dazzling coronal radiance visible during the obscuration had caused it to be believed although he himself never witnessed a total eclipse of the sun he carefully collected and compared the remarks of those more fortunate and concluded that the ring of flame-like splendour seen on such occasions was caused by the reflection of the solar rays from matter condensed in the neighbourhood either of the sun or moon to the solar explanation he gave his own decided preference but with one of those curious flashes of half prophetic insight characteristic of his genius declared that it should be laid by ready for use not brought into immediate requisition so literally was his advice acted upon that the theory which we now know to be broadly speaking the correct one only emerged from the repository of anticipated truths after two hundred and thirty-six years of almost complete retirement and even then timorously and with hesitation the first eclipse of which the attendant phenomena were observed with tolerable exactness was that which was central in the south of france may twelve seventeen o six cassini then put forward the view that the crown of pale light seen round the lunar disk was caused by the illumination of the zodiacal light but it failed to receive the attention which as it stepped in the right direction it undoubtedly merited nine years later we meet with halley's comments on a similar event the first which had occurred in london since march twenty eleven forty 
by nine in the morning of may third seventeen fifteen the obscuration he tells us was about ten digits when the face and color of the sky began to change from perfect serene azure blue to a more dusky livid color having an eye of purple intermixed a few seconds before the sun was all hid there discovered itself round the moon a luminous ring about a digit or perhaps a tenth part of the moon's diameter in breadth it was of a pale whiteness or rather pearl color seeming to be a little tinged with the colors of the iris and to be concentric with the moon whence i concluded it the moon's atmosphere but the great height thereof far exceeding our earth's atmosphere and the observation of some who found the breadth of the ring to increase on the west side of the moon as immersion approached together with the contrary sentiments of those whose judgment i shall always revere newton is most probably referred to makes me less confident especially in a matter wheretofore i confess i give not all the attention requisite he concludes by declining to decide whether the enlightened atmosphere which the appearance in all respects resembled belonged to sun or moon a french academician who happened to be in london at the time was less guarded in expressing an opinion the chevalier de louisville declared emphatically for the lunar atmospheric theory of the corona and his authority carried great weight it was however much discredited by an observation made by moraldi in seventeen twenty four to the effect that the luminous ring instead of travelling with the moon was traversed by it this was in reality decisive though as usual belief lagged far behind demonstration in seventeen fifteen a novel explanation had been offered by delisle and lahir supported by experiments regarded at the time as perfectly satisfactory the aureola round the eclipsed sun they argued is simply a result of the diffraction or apparent bending of the sunbeams that graze the surface of the lunar globe an effect of the same kind as the colored fringes of shadows and this view prevailed amongst the men of science until and even after brewster showed with clear and simple decisiveness that such an effect could by no possibility be appreciable at our distance from the moon don jose joachim de ferrer however who observed a total eclipse of the sun at kinderhook in the state of new york on june sixteenth eighteen o six ignoring this refined optical rationale considered two alternative explanations of the phenomenon as alone possible the bright ring round the moon must be due to the illumination either of a lunar or of a solar atmosphere in the former he calculated that it should have a height fifty times that of the earth's gaseous envelope such an atmosphere he rightly concluded cannot belong to the moon but must without any doubt belong to the sun but he stood alone in this unhesitating assertion the importance of the problem was first brought fully home to astronomers by the eclipse of eighteen forty two the brilliant and complex appearance which on that occasion challenged the attention of so many observers demanded and received no longer the casual attention hitherto bestowed upon it but the most earnest study of those interested in the progress of science nevertheless it was only by degrees and through a process of exclusions to use a baconian phrase that the corona was put in its right place as a solar appendage as every other available explanation proved inadmissible and dropped out of sight the broad presentation of fact remained which though of sufficiently obvious interpretation was long and persistently misconstrued nor was it until eighteen sixty nine that absolutely decisive evidence on the subject was forthcoming as we shall see further on sir john herschel writing to his venerable aunt relates that when the brilliant red flames burst into view behind the dark moon on the morning of the eighth of july eighteen forty two 
the populace of milan with the usual inconsequence of a crowd raised the shout es leben die astronomen in reality none were less prepared for their apparition than the class to whom the applause due to the magnificent spectacle was thus adjudged and in some measure through their own fault for many partial hints and some distinct statements from earlier observers had given unheeded notice that some such phenomenon might be expected to attend a solar eclipse what we now call the chromosphere is an envelope of glowing gases by which the sun is completely covered and from which the prominences are emanations eruptive or flame-like now continual indications of the presence of this fire ocean had been detected during eclipses in the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries captain stanion describing in a letter to flamsteed an occurrence of the kind witnessed by him at Bern on may one seventeen o six says that the sun's getting out of the eclipse was preceded by a blood-red streak of light from its left limb a precisely similar appearance was noted by both halley and de louisville in seventeen fifteen during annular eclipses by lord aberdour in seventeen thirty seven and by short in seventeen forty eight the tint of the ruby border being however subdued to brown or dusky red by the surviving sunlight while observations identical in character were made at amsterdam in eighteen twenty at edinburgh by henderson in eighteen thirty six and at new york in eighteen thirty eight flames or prominences if more conspicuous are less constant in their presence than the glowing stratum from which they spring the first to describe them was a swedish professor named vesenius who observed a total eclipse at gothenburg may second seventeen thirty three his astonishment equalled his admiration when he perceived just outside the edge of the lunar disk a suspended as it seemed in the coronal atmosphere three or four reddish spots or clouds one of which was so large as to be detected with the naked eye as to their nature he did not even offer a speculation further than by tacitly referring them to the moon the observation was repeated in seventeen seventy eight by a spanish admiral but with no better success in directing efficacious attention to the phenomenon don antonio ulua was on board his ship the espana in passage from the azores to cape st vincent on the twenty fourth of june in that year when a total eclipse of the sun occurred of which he has left a valuable description his notices of the corona are full of interest but what just now concerns us is the appearance of a red luminous point near the edge of the moon which gradually increases in size as the moon moved away from it and was visible during about a minute and a quarter he was satisfied that it belonged to the sun because of its fiery color and growth in magnitude and supposed that it was occasioned by some crevice or inequality in the moon's limb through which the solar light penetrated allusions less precise both prior and subsequent which it is now easy to refer to similar objects such as the slender columns of smoke seen by ferrer might be detailed but the evidence already adduced suffices to show that the prominences viewed with such amazement in eighteen forty two were no unprecedented or even unusual phenomena it was more important however to decide what was their nature than whether their appearance might have been anticipated they were generally and not very incorrectly set down as solar clouds arago believed them to shine by reflected light but the abbe Petal rightly considered them to be self-luminous. Writing in a Montpelier paper of July 16, 1842, he declared that we had now become assured of the existence of a third or outer solar envelope composed of a glowing substance of a bright rose tint forming mountains of prodigious elevation analogous in character to the clouds piled above our horizons this first distinct recognition of a very important feature of our great luminary 
was probably founded on an observation made by Berard at Toulon during the then recent eclipse of a very fine red band irregularly dentilated or as it were creviced here and there encircling a large arc of the moon's circumference it can hardly however be said to have attracted general notice until july twenty eighth eighteen fifty one on that day a total eclipse took place which was observed with considerable success in various parts of sweden and norway by a number of english astronomers mr hind saw on the south limb of the moon a long range of rose-coloured flames described by dawes as a low ridge of red prominences resembling in outline the tops of a very irregular range of hills airy termed the portion of this rugged lines of projections visible to him the sierra and was struck with its brilliant light and nearly scarlet colour its true character of a continuous solar envelope was inferred from these data by grant swan and littrow and was by father sesci after the great eclipse of eighteen sixty formally accepted as established several prominences of remarkable forms especially one variously compared to a turkish scimitar a sickle and a boomerang were seen in eighteen fifty one in connection with them two highly significant circumstances were pointed out first that of the approximate coincidence between their positions and those of sunspots previously observed next that the moon passed over them leaving them behind and revealing successive portions as she advanced this latter perfectly well attested fact was justly considered by the astronomer royal and others as affording absolute certainty of the solar dependence of these singular objects nevertheless skeptics were still found mr fay of the french academy inclined to a lunar origin for them feilich of greifswald published in eighteen fifty two a treatise for the express purpose of proving all the luminous phenomena attendant on solar eclipses corona prominences and sierra to be purely optical appearances happily however the unanswerable arguments of the photographic camera were soon to be made available against such hardy incredulity thus the virtual discovery of the solar appendages both coronal and chromospheric may be said to have been begun in 1842 and completed in 1851 the current herschelian theory of the solar constitution remained however for the time intact difficulties indeed were thickening around it but their discussion was perhaps felt to be premature and they were permitted to accumulate without debate until fortified by fresh testimony into unexpected and overwhelming preponderance end of chapter three part two chapter four part one of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by agnes mary clark part one progress of astronomy during the first half of the nineteenth century chapter four planetary discoveries part one in the course of his early gropings towards a law of the planetary distances kepler tried the experiment of setting a planet invisible by reason of its smallness to revolve in the vast region of seemingly desert space separating mars from jupiter the disproportionate magnitude of the same interval was explained by kant as due to the overweening size of jupiter the zone 
in which each planet moved was, according to the philosopher of Königsberg, to be regarded as the empty storehouse from which its materials had been derived. A definite relation should thus exist between the planetary masses and the planetary intervals. Lambert, on the other hand, sportively suggested that the body or bodies, for it is noticeable that he speaks of them in the plural, which once bridged this portentous gap in the solar system, might, in some remote age, have been swept away by a great comet and forced to attend its wanderings through space. These speculations were destined, before long, to assume a more definite form. Johann Daniel Titius, a professor at Wittenberg, where he died in 1796, pointed out in 1772, in a note to a translation of Bonnet's Contemplation de la Nature, the existence of a remarkable symmetry in the disposition of the bodies constituting the solar system. By a certain series of numbers, increasing in irregular progression, he showed that the distances of the six known planets from the Sun might be represented with a close approach to accuracy, but with one striking interruption. The term of the series succeeding that which corresponded to the orbit of Mars was without a celestial representative, the orderly flow of the sequence was thus singularly broken. The space where a planet should, in fulfillment of the law, have revolved was, it appeared, untenanted. Johann Ellert Bode, then just about to begin his long career as leader of astronomical thought and work at Berlin, marked at once the anomaly and filled the vacant interval with a hypothetical planet. The discovery of Uranus at a distance falling but slightly short of perfect conformity with the law of Titus lent weight to a seemingly hazardous prediction and von Zach was actually at the pains in 1785 to calculate what he termed analogical elements for this unseen and, by any effect or influence, unfelt body. The search for it, through confessedly scarcely less chimerical than that of alchemists for the philosopher's stone, he kept steadily in view for fifteen years and at length, September 21, 1800, succeeded in organizing, in combination with five other German astronomers, assembled at Lilienthal, a force of what he jocularly termed celestial police, for the express purpose of tracking and intercepting the fugitive subject of the sun. The zodiac was accordingly divided for purposes of scrutiny into 24 zones, their apportionment to separate observers was in part effected, and the association was rapidly getting into working order, when news arrived that the missing planet had been found. Through no systematic plan of search, but by the diligent, though otherwise directed, labors of a distant watcher of the skies. Giuseppe Piazzi was born at Ponte in the 
Valtellin, July 16, 1746. He studied at various places and times under Teraboski, Beccaria, Jacur, and Lisur, and having entered the Thirteen Order of Monks at the age of eighteen, he taught philosophy, science, and theology in several of the Italian cities as well as in Malta until 1780 when the chair of mathematics in the University of Palermo was offered to and accepted by him. Prince Caramanico, then viceroy of Sicily, had scientific learnings and was easily won over to the project of building an observatory, a commodious foundation for which was afforded by one of the towers of the viceregal palace. This architecturally incongruous addition to an ancient Saracenic edifice, once the abode of Calibit and Zirid emirs, was completed in February 1791. Piazzi, meanwhile, had devoted nearly three years to the assiduous study of his new profession, acquiring a practical knowledge of Lalande's method at the École Militaire and of Maskelyne's at the Royal Observatory, and returned to Palermo in 1789, bringing with him, in the great five-foot circle which he had prevailed upon Ramsden to construct, the most perfect measuring instrument hitherto employed by an astronomer. He had been above nine years at work on his star catalogue, and was still profoundly unconscious that a place amongst the Lilienthal band of astronomical detectives was being held in reserve for him when on the first evening of the 19th century, January 1, 1801, he noticed the position of an eighth magnitude star in a part of the constellation Taurus, to which an arrow of Wollstones had directed his special attention. Reobserving, according to his custom, the same set of fifty stars on four consecutive nights, it seemed to him, on the second, that the one in question had slightly shifted its position to the west. On the third, he assured himself of the fact, and believed that he had chanced upon a new kind of comet without tail or coma. The wandering body, whatever its nature, exchanged retrograde for direct motion on January 14, and was carefully watched by Piazzi until February 11, when a dangerous illness interrupted his observations. He had, however, not omitted to give notice of his discovery, but so precarious were communications in those unpeaceful times that his letter to Oriani of January 23 did not reach Milan until April 5, while a missive of one day later addressed to Bode came to hand at Berlin March 20. The delay just afforded time for the publication by a young philosopher of Jena named Hegel of a dissertation showing by the clearest light of reason that the number of the planets could not exceed seven and exposing the folly of certain devotees of induction who sought a new celestial body merely to fill a gap in a numerical series. Unabashed by speculative scorn, Bode had scarcely read Piazzi's letter when he concluded that it referred to the precise body in question. The news spread rapidly 
and created a profound sensation, not unmixed with alarm, lest this latest addition to the solar family should have been found only to be again lost. For, by that time, Piazzi's moving star was too near the sun to be any longer visible, and in order to rediscover it, after conjunction, a tolerably accurate knowledge of its path was indispensable. But a planetary orbit had never before been calculated from such scanty data as Piazzi's observation afforded, and the attempts made by nearly every astronomer of note in Germany to compass the problem were manifestly inadequate, failing even to account for the positions in which the body had been actually seen, and a fortiori serving only to mislead as to the places where, from September 1801, it ought once more to have become discernible. It was in this extremity that the celebrated mathematician Gauss came to the rescue. He was then in his twenty-fifth year, and was earning his bread by tuition at Brunswick, with many possibilities, but no settled career before him. The news from Palermo may be said to have converted him from an arithmetician into an astronomer. He was already in possession of a new and more general method of computing elliptical orbits and a system of least squares, which he had devised, though not published, enabled him to extract the most probable result from a given set of observations. Armed with these novel powers, he set to work, and the communication in November of his elements and ephemeris for the lost object revived the drooping hopes of the little band of eager searchers. Their patience, however, was to be still further tried. Clouds, mist, and sleet seemed to have conspired to cover the retreat of the fugitive. But on the last night of the year, the sky cleared unexpectedly with the setting in of a hard frost, and there, in the northwestern part of Virgo, nearly in the position assigned by Gauss to the runaway planet, a strange star was discerned by von Zag at Gotha, and on a subsequent evening, the anniversary of the original discovery by Albers at Bremen. The name of Ceres, as the tutelary goddess of Sicily was, by Piazzi's request, bestowed upon this first known of the numerous and probably all but innumerable family of the minor planets. The recognition of the second followed as the immediate consequence of the detection of the first. Albers had made himself so familiar with the positions of the small stars along the track of the long missing body, that he was at once struck, March 28, 1802, with the presence of an intruder near the spot where he had recently identified Ceres. He at first believed the newcomer to be a variable star, usually inconspicuous, but just then, at its maximum of brightness. But within two hours, he had convinced himself that it was no fixed star, but a rapidly moving object. The aid of Gauss was again invoked, and his prompt calculations showed that this fresh celestial acquaintance, named Pallas by Albers, revolved around the sun at nearly the same mean distance as Ceres, and was beyond question of a strictly analogous character.
character. This result was perplexing in the extreme, the symmetry and simplicity of the planetary scheme appeared finally compromised by the admission of many, where room could, according to old-fashioned rules, only be found for one. A daring hypothesis of Albert's invention provided an exit from the difficulty. He supposed that both Ceres and Pallas were fragments of a primitive trans-Martian planet blown to pieces in the remote past, either by the action of internal forces or by the impact of a comet, and predicted that many more such fragments would be found to circulate in the same region. He, moreover, pointed out that these numerous orbits, however much they might differ in other respects, must all have a common line of intersection, and that the bodies moving in them must consequently pass, at each revolution, through two opposite points of the heavens, one situated in the whale, the other in the constellation of the Virgin, where already Pallas had been found and Ceres recaptured. The intimation that fresh discoveries might be expected in those particular regions was singularly justified by the detection of two bodies, now known respectively as Juno and Vesta. The first was found near the predicted spot in Cirrus by Harden, Schroeder's assistant at Lelintel, September 2, 1804. The second by Albers himself in Virgo, after three years of persistent scrutiny, March 29, 1807. The theory of an exploded planet now seemed to have everything in its favour. It required that the mean or average distances of the newly discovered bodies should be nearly the same, but admitted a wide range of variety in the shapes and positions of their orbits, provided always that they preserved common points of intersection. These conditions were fulfilled with a striking approach to exactness. Three of the four asteroids, a designation introduced by Sir W. Herschel, conformed with very approximate precision to Baud's law of distances. They all traversed in their circuit round the sun, nearly the same parts of Cirrus and Virgo, while the eccentricities and inclinations of their path departed widely from the planetary type, that of Pallas, to take an extreme instance, making with the ecliptic an angle of nearly 35 degrees. The minuteness of these bodies appeared further to strengthen the imputation of a fragmentary character. Herschel estimated the diameter of Ceres at 162, that of Pallas at 147 miles. But these values are now known to be considerably too small. A suspected variability of brightness in some of the asteroids, somewhat hazardously explained as due to the irregularities of figure to be expected in cosmical pots herds, so to speak, was added to the confirmatory evidence. The strong point of the theory, however, lay not in what it explained, but in what it had predicted. It had been twice confirmed by actual exploration of the skies, and had produced, in the recognition of Vesta, the first recorded instance of the premeditated discovery of a heavenly body. The view not only commended itself to the facile imagination of the unlearned, 
but received the sanction of the highest scientific authority. The great Lagrange bestowed upon it his analytical imprimatur, showing that the explosive forces required to produce the supposed catastrophe came well with the bounds of possibility, since a velocity of less than twenty times that of a cannonball leaving the gun's mouth would have sufficed, according to his calculation, to launch the asteroidal fragments on their respective path. Indeed, he was disposed to regard the hypothesis of disruption as more generally available than its author had designed it to be and proposed to supplement with it as explanatory of the eccentric orbits of comets. The nebular theory of Laplace, thereby obtaining, as he said, a complete view of the origin of the planetary system more conformable to nature and mechanical laws than any yet proposed. Nevertheless, the hypothesis of Olbers has not held its ground. It seemed as if all the evidence available for its support had been produced at once and spontaneously while the unfavorable items were elicited slowly and, as it were, by cross-examination. A more extended acquaintance with the group of bodies, whose peculiarities it was framed to explain, has shown them, after all, as recalcitrant to any such explanation. Coincidences, at the first view, significant and striking have been swamped by contrary examples, and a hasty general conclusion has, by a not uncommon destiny, at last perished under the accumulation of particulars. Moreover, as has been remarked by Professor Newcomb, mutual perturbations would rapidly efface all traces of a common disruptive origin and the catastrophe, to be perceptible in its effects, should have been comparatively recent. A new generation of astronomers had arisen before any additions were made to the little family of the minor planets. Piazzi died in 1826, Harding in 1834, Olbers in 1840. All those who had prepared or participated in the first discoveries passed away without witnessing their resumption. In 1830, however, a certain Henke, ex-postmaster in the Prussian town of Dresden, set himself to watch for new planets and after fifteen long years, his patience was rewarded. The asteroid, found by him December 8, 1845, received the name of Astra, and his further persecution of the search resulted July 1, 1847, in the discovery of Hebe. A few weeks later, August 13, John Russell Hind, 1823 to 1893, after many months' exploration from Mr. Bishop's observatory in the Regent's Park, picked up Iris and October 18, Flora. The next on the list was Metis, found by Mr. Graham. April 25, 1848, at Mercury in Ireland. At the close of the period to which our attention is at present limited, the number of these small bodies known to astronomy was 13, and the course of discovery has since proceeded far more rapidly 
and with less interruption. Both in itself and in its consequences, the recognition of the minor planets was of the highest importance to science. The traditional ideas regarding the constitution of the solar system were enlarged by the admission of a new class of bodies, strongly contrasted yet strictly coordinate with the old established planetary order, the profusion of resource, so conspicuous in the living kingdom of nature, was seen to prevail no less in the celestial spaces, and some faint preliminary notion was afforded of the indefinite complexity of our relations underlying the apparent simplicity of the majestic scheme to which our world belongs. Both theoretical and practical astronomy derived profit from the admission of these apparently insignificant strangers to the rights of citizenship of the solar system. The disturbance of their motions by their giant neighbors afforded a more accurate knowledge of the Jovian mass, which Laplace had taken about one-fifth too small. The anomalous character of their orbits presented geometers with highly stimulating problems in the theory of perturbation, while the exigencies of the first discovery had produced the Theoria Motus, and won Gauss over to the ranks of calculating astronomy. Moreover, the sure prospect of further detections powerfully incited to the exploration of the skies. Observers became more numerous and more zealous in view of the prizes held out to them. Star maps were diligently constructed, and the sidereal multitude strewn along the great zodiacal belt acquired a fresh interest when it was perceived that its least conspicuous member might be a planetary shred or projectile in the dignified disguise of a distant sun. Harding's celestial atlas designed for the special purpose of facilitating asteroidal research, was the first systematic attempt to represent to the eye the telescopic aspect of the heavens. It was, while engaged on its construction, that the Leliental observer successfully intercepted Juno on her passage through the whale in 1804 whereupon promoted to Göttingen, he there completed in 1822 the arduous task so opportunely entered upon a score of years previously. Still more important were the great star maps of the Berlin Academy, undertaken at Bessel's suggestion with the same object of distinguishing errant from fixed stars, and executed under Encke's supervision during the years 1830 to 59. They have played a noteworthy part in the history of planetary discovery, nor of the minor kind alone. We have now to recount an event unique in scientific history. The discovery of Neptune has been characterized as the result of a movement of the age, and with some justice, it had become necessary to the integrity of planetary theory. Until it was accomplished, the phantom of an unexplained anomaly in the orderly movements of the solar system must have continued to haunt astronomical consciousness. Moreover, it was prepared by many, suggested as possible by not a few, and actually achieved simultaneously, independently, 
and completely by two investigators. The position of the planet Uranus was recorded as that of a fixed star no less than 20 times between 1690 and the epoch of its final detection by Herschel. But these early observations, far from affording the expected facilities for the calculation of its orbit, proved a source of grievous perplexity. The utmost ingenuity of geometers failed to combine them satisfactorily with the later Uranian places, and it became evident either that they were widely erroneous, or that the revolving body was wandering from its ancient track. The simplest course was to reject them altogether, and this was done in the new tables published in 1821 by Alexis Bouvard, the indefatigable computating partner of Laplace. But the trouble was not thus to be got rid of. After a few years, fresh irregularities began to appear and continued to increase until absolutely intolerable. It may be stated as illustrative of the perfection to which astronomy had been brought, that divergences regarded as menacing the very foundation of its theories never entered the range of unaided vision. In other words, if the theoretical and the real Uranus had been placed side by side in the sky, they would have seemed to the sharpest eye to form a single body. The idea that these enigmatical disturbances were due to the attraction of an unknown exterior body was a tolerably obvious one, and we accordingly find it suggested in many different quarters. Bouvard himself was perhaps the first to conceive it. He kept the possibility continually in view and bequeathed to his nephew's diligence the inquiry into its reality when he felt that his own span was drawing to a close. But before any progress had been made with it, he had already, June 7, 1843, ceased to breathe and to calculate. The Rev. T. G. Hasse actually entertained in 1834 the notion, but found his powers inadequate to the task of assigning an approximate place to the disturbing body, and Bessel, in 1840, laid his plans for an assault in form upon the Uranian difficulty, the triumphant exit from which fatal illness frustrated his hopes of effecting or even witnessing. The problem was practically untouched when, in 1841, an undergraduate of St. John's College, Cambridge, formed the resolution of grappling with it. The projected task was an arduous one. There were no guiding precedents for its conduct. Analytical obstacles had to be encountered so formidable as to appear invincible even to such a mathematician as Airy. John Couch Adams, however, had no sooner taken his degree, which he did as senior wrangler in January 1843, than he set resolutely to work and, on October 21st, 1845, was able to communicate to the Astronomer Royal numerical estimates of the elements and mass of the unknown planet together with an indication of its actual place in the heavens. These results, it has been well said, gave the final and inexorable proof 
of the validity of Newton's law. The date October 1st, 1845, may therefore be regarded as marking a distinct epoch in the history of gravitational astronomy. End of chapter 4, part 1。Sir George Bedell Airy had begun in 1835 his long and energetic administration of the Royal Observatory and was already in possession of data vitally important to the momentous inquiry then on foot. At his suggestion and under his superintendence, the reduction of all the planetary observations made at Greenwich from 1750 onwards had been undertaken in 1833 the results published in 1846 constituted a permanent and universal stock of materials for the correction of planetary theory but in the meantime investigators both native and foreign were freely supplied with the places and errors which clearly exhibiting the discrepancies between observation and calculation between what was and what was expected formed the very groundwork of future improvements mr adams had no reason to complain of official discourtesy his labours received due and indispensable aid but their purpose was regarded as chimerical i have always sir george airy wrote considered the correctness of a distant mathematical result to be a subject rather of moral than of mathematical evidence and that actually before him seemed from its very novelty to incur a suspicion of unlikelihood no problem in planetary disturbance had heretofore been attacked so to speak from the rear the inverse method was untried and might well be deemed impracticable for the difficulty of determining the perturbations produced by a given planet is small compared with the difficulty of finding a planet by its resulting perturbations laplace might have quailed before it yet it was now grappled with as a first essay in celestial dynamics moreover adams unaccountably neglected to answer until too late a question regarded by airy in the light of an experimentum crucis as to the soundness of the new theory nor did he himself take any steps to obtain a publicity which he was more anxious to merit than to secure the investigation consequently remained buried in obscurity it is now known that had a search been instituted in the autumn of eighteen forty five for the remote body whose existence had been so marvellously foretold it would have been found within three and a half lunar diameters one degree forty nine minutes of the spot assigned to it by adams a competitor however equally daring and more fortunate audax fortuna adjutus as gauss said of him was even then entering the field urbane jean joseph le verrier the son of a small government employé in normandy was born at saint lo march eleventh eighteen eleven he studied with brilliant success at the ecole polytechnique accepted the post of astronomical teacher there in eighteen thirty seven and docile to circumstance immediately concentrated the whole of his vast though as yet undeveloped powers upon the formidable problems of celestial mechanics he lost no time in proving to the mathematical world that the race of giants 
was not extinct two papers on the stability of the solar system presented to the academy of sciences september sixteen and october fourteen eighteen thirty nine showed him to be the worthy successor of lagrange and laplace and encouraged hopes destined to be abundantly realized his attention was directed by arago to the uranian difficulty in eighteen forty five when he cheerfully put aside certain intricate cometary researches upon which he happened to be engaged in order to obey with dutiful promptitude the summons of the astronomical chief of france in his first memoir on the subject communicated to the academy november tenth eighteen forty five he proved the inadequacy of all known causes of disturbance to account for the vagaries of uranus in a second june one eighteen forty eight he demonstrated that only an exterior body occupying at a certain date a determinate position in the zodiac could produce the observed effects in a third august thirty one eighteen forty six he assigned the orbit of the disturbing body and announced its visibility as an object with a sensible disk about as bright as a star of the eighth magnitude the question was now visibly approaching an issue on september tenth sir john herschel declared to the british association respecting the hypothetical new planet we see it as columbus saw america from the coast of spain its movements had been felt trembling along the far-reaching line of our analysis with a certainty hardly inferior to that of ocular demonstration less than a fortnight later september twenty three professor gall of the berlin observatory received a letter from le verrier requesting his aid in the telescopic part of the inquiry already analytically completed he directed his refractor to the heavens that same night and perceived within less than a degree of the spot indicated an object with a measurable disc nearly three seconds in diameter its absence from bremiker's recently completed map of that region of the sky showed it to be no star and its movement in the predicted direction confirmed without delay the strong persuasion of its planetary nature in this remarkable manner the existence of the remote member of our system known as neptune was ascertained but the discovery which faithfully reflected the duplicate character of the investigation which led to it had been already secured at cambridge before it was announced from berlin sir george airy's incredulity vanished in the face of the striking coincidence between the position assigned by le verrier to the unknown planet in june and that laid down by adams in the previous october and on the ninth of july he wrote to professor challis director of the cambridge observatory recommending a search with the great northumberland equatorial had a good star map been at hand the process would have been a simple one but of bremiker's hora twenty one no news had yet reached england and there was no other sufficiently comprehensive to be available for an inquiry which in the absence of such aid promised to be both long and laborious as the event proved it might have been neither after four days of observing chalice wrote october twelfth eighteen forty six to airy the planet was in my grasp if only i had examined or mapped the observations had he done so the first honours in the discovery both theoretical and optical would have fallen to the university of cambridge but professor chalice had other astronomical avocations to attend to and moreover his faith in the precision of the indications furnished to him was by his own confession a very feeble one for both reasons he postponed to a later stage of the proceedings the discussion and comparison of the data nightly furnished to him by his telescope and thus allowed to lie as it were latent 
in his observations the momentous result which his diligence had ensured but which his delay suffered to be anticipated nevertheless it should not be forgotten that the berlin astronomer had two circumstances in his favour apart from which his swift success could hardly have been achieved the first was the possession of a good star map the second was the clear and confident nature of leverrier's instructions look where i tell you he seemed authoritatively to say and you will see an object such as i describe and in fact not only gall on the twenty third of september but also chalus on the twenty ninth immediately after reading the french geometer's lucid and impressive treatise picked out from among the stellar points strewing the zodiac a small planetary disc which eventually proved to be that of the precise body he had been in search of during two months the controversy that ensued had its ignominious side but it was entered into by neither of the parties principally concerned adams bore the disappointment which the dilatory proceedings at greenwich and cambridge had inflicted upon him with quiet heroism his silence on the subject of what another man would have called his wrongs remained unbroken to the end of his life and he took every opportunity of testifying his admiration for the genius of le verrier personal questions however vanish in the magnitude of the event they relate to by it the last lingering doubts as to the absolute exactness of the newtonian law were dissipated recondite analytical methods received a confirmation brilliant and intelligible even to the minds of the vulgar and emerged from the patient solitude of the study to enjoy an hour of clamorous triumph for ever invisible to the unaided eye of man a sister globe to our earth was shown to circulate in perpetual frozen exile at thirty times its distance from the sun nay the possibility was made apparent that the limits of our system were not even thus reached but that yet profounder abysses of space might shelter obedient though little favoured members of the solar family by future astronomers to be recognised through the sympathetic thrillings of neptune even as neptune himself was recognised through the tell-tale deviations of uranus it is curious to find that the fruit of adams's and leverrier's laborious investigations had been accidentally all but snatched half a century before it was ripe to be gathered on the eighth and again on the tenth of may seventeen ninety five lalande noted the position of neptune as that of a fixed star but perceiving that the two observations did not agree he suppressed the first as erroneous and pursued the inquiry no further an immortality which he would have been the last to despise hung in the balance the feather weight of his carelessness however kicked the beam and the discovery was reserved to be more hardly won by later comers bode's law did good service in the quest for a transuranian planet by affording ground for a probable assumption as to its distance a starting point for approximation was provided by it but it was soon found to be considerably at fault even uranus is about thirty-six millions of miles nearer to the sun than the order of progression requires and neptune's vast distance of two thousand eight hundred million should be increased by no less than eight hundred million miles and its period of one hundred and sixty five lengthened out to two hundred and twenty five years in order to bring it into conformity with the curious and unexplained rule which planetary discoveries have alternately tended to confirm and to invalidate within seventeen days of its identification with the berlin achromatic neptune was found to be attended by a satellite this discovery was the first notable performance of the celebrated two-foot reflector erected by 
mr lascelles at his suggestively named residence of starfield near liverpool william lascelles was a brewer by profession but by inclination an astronomer born at bolton in lancashire june eighteen seventeen ninety nine he closed a life of eminent usefulness to science october five eighteen eighteen thus spanning with his well-spent years four-fifths of the momentous period which we have undertaken to traverse at the age of twenty-one being without the means to purchase he undertook to construct telescopes and naturally turned his attention to the reflecting sort as favouring amateur efforts by the comparative simplicity of its structure his native ingenuity was remarkable and was developed by the hourly exigencies of his successive enterprises their uniform success encouraged him to enlarge his aims and in eighteen forty four he visited burr castle for the purpose of inspecting the machine used in polishing the giant speculum of parsontown in the construction of his new instrument however he eventually discarded the model there obtained and worked on a method of his own assisted by the supreme mechanical skills of james naismith the result was a newtonian of exquisite definition with an aperture of two and a focal length of twenty feet provided by a novel artifice with the equatorial mounting previously regarded as available only for refractors this beautiful instrument afforded to its maker october tenth eighteen forty six a cursory view of a neptunian attendant but the planet was then approaching the sun and it was not until the following july that the observation could be verified which it was completely first by lascelles himself and somewhat later by otto stuve and bond of cambridge u s when it is considered that this remote object shines by reflecting sunlight reduced by distance to one over nine hundredth of the intensity with which it illuminates our moon the fact of its visibility even in the most perfect telescopes is a somewhat surprising one it can only indeed be accounted for by attributing to it dimensions very considerable for a body of the secondary order it shares with the moons of uranus the peculiarity of retrograde motion that is to say its revolutions running counter to the grand current of movement in the solar system are performed from east to west in a plane inclined at an angle of thirty five degrees to that of the ecliptic their swiftness serves to measure the mass of the globe round which they are performed for while our moon takes twenty seven days and nearly eight hours to complete its circuit of the earth the satellite of neptune at a distance not greatly inferior sweeps round its primary in five days and twenty-one hours showing according to a very simple principle of computation that it is urged by a force seventeen times greater than the terrestrial pull upon the lunar orb combining this result with those of professor barnard's and dr c s recent measurements of the small telescopic disc of this farthest known planet it is found that while in mass neptune equals seventeen in bulk it is equivalent to forty nine earths this is as much as to say that it is composed of relatively very light materials or more probably of materials distended by internal heat as yet unwasted by radiation into space to about five times the volume they would occupy in the interior of our globe the fact at any rate is fairly well ascertained that the average density of neptune is about twice that of water we must now turn from this late recognized member of our system to bestow some brief attention upon the still fruitful field of discovery offered by one of the immemorial five the family of saturn unlike that of its brilliant neighbour has been gradually introduced to the notice of astronomers titan the sixth saturnian moon in order of distance led the way being detected by huygens march twenty five sixteen fifty five 
cassini made the acquaintance of four more between sixteen seventy one and sixteen eighty four while mimas and enceladus the two innermost were caught by herschel in seventeen eighty nine as they threaded their lucid way along the edge of the almost vanished ring in the distances of these seven revolving bodies from their primary an order of progression analogous to that pointed out by titius in the planetary intervals was found to prevail but with one conspicuous interruption similar to that which had first suggested the search for new members of the solar system between titan and japetus the sixth and seventh reckoning outwards there was obviously room for another satellite it was discovered on both sides of the atlantic simultaneously on the nineteenth of september eighteen forty eight mr w c bond employing the splendid fifteen inch refractor of the harvard observatory noticed september sixteen a minute star situated in the plane of saturn's rings the same object was discerned by mr lassell on the eighteenth on the following evening both observers perceived that the problematical speck of light kept up with instead of being left behind by the planet as it moved and hence inferred its true character hyperion the seventh by distance and eighth by recognition of saturn's attendant train is of so insignificant a size when compared with some of its fellow moons titan is but little inferior to the planet mars as to have suggested to sir john herschel the idea that it might be only one of several bodies revolving very close together in fact an asteroidal satellite but the conjecture has so far not been verified the coincidence of its duplicate discovery was singularly paralleled two years later galileo's amazement when his optic glass revealed to him the triple form of saturn planeta tergeminus has proved to be like the laughter of the gods inextinguishable it must revive in every one who contemplates anew the unique arrangements of that world apart known to us as the saturnian system the resolution of the so-called ansi or handles into one encircling ring by huygens in sixteen fifty five the discovery by cassini in sixteen seventy five of the division of that ring into two concentric ones together with laplace's investigation of the conditions of stability of such a formation constituted with some minor observations the sum of the knowledge obtained up to the middle of the last century on the subject of this remarkable formation the first place in the discovery now about to be related belongs to an american astronomer william cranch bond born in seventeen eighty nine at portland in the state of maine was a watchmaker whom the solar eclipse of eighteen o six attracted to study the wonders of the heavens when in eighteen fifteen the erection of an observatory in connection with harvard college cambridge was first contemplated he undertook a mission to england for the purpose of studying the working of similar institutions there and on his return erected a private observatory at dorchester where he worked diligently for many years then at last in eighteen forty three the long postponed design of the harvard authorities was resumed and on the completion of the new establishment bond who had been from eighteen thirty eight officially connected with the college and had carried on his scientific labours within its precincts was offered and accepted the post of its director placed in eighteen forty seven in possession of one of the finest instruments in the world a masterpiece of merz and mahler he headed the now long list of distinguished transatlantic observers like the elder struve he left an heir to his office and to his eminence but george bond unfortunately died in eighteen sixty five at the early age of thirty nine having survived his father but six years on the night of november fifteenth eighteen fifty the air remarkably enough being so hazy that only the brightest stars could be perceived with the naked eye william bond discerned a dusky ring extending about halfway between the inner brighter one and the globe of saturn 
a fortnight later but before the observation had been announced in england the same appearance was seen by the rev w r dawes with the comparatively small refractor of his observatory at wateringbury and on december three was described by mr lascell then on a visit to him as something like a crape veil covering a part of the sky within the inner ring next morning the times containing the report of bond's discovery reached wateringbury the most surprising circumstance in the matter was that the novel appendage had remained so long unrecognized as the rings opened out to their full extent it became obvious with very moderate optical assistance yet some of the most acute observers who have ever lived using instruments of vast power had heretofore failed to detect its presence it soon appeared however that gall of berlin had noticed june tenth eighteen thirty eight a veil-like extension of the lucid ring across half the dark space separating it from the planet but the observation although communicated at the time to the berlin academy of sciences had remained barren traces of the dark ring moreover were found in drawings executed by campini in sixteen sixty four and by hook in sixteen sixty six while picard june fifteenth sixteen seventy three hadley spring of seventeen twenty and herschel had all undoubtedly seen it under the aspect of a dark bar or belt crossing the saturnian globe it was then of no recent origin but there seemed reason to think that it had lately gained considerably in brightness the full meaning of this suspected change it was reserved for later investigations to develop what we may in a certain sense call the closing result of the race for discovery in which several observers seemed at that time to be engaged was the establishment on a satisfactory footing of our acquaintance with the dependent system of uranus sir william herschel whose researches formed in so many distinct lines of astronomical inquiry the starting points of future knowledge detected january eleventh seventeen eighty seven two uranian moons since called oberon and titania and ascertained the curious circumstance of their motion in a plane almost at right angles to the ecliptic in a direction contrary to that of all previously known denizens other than cometary of the solar kingdom he believed that he caught occasional glimpses of four more but never succeeded in assuring himself of their substantial existence even the two first remained unseen save by himself until eighteen twenty eight when his son reobserved them with a twenty-foot reflector similar to that with which they had been originally discovered thenceforward they were kept fairly within view but their four questionable companions in spite of some false alarms of detection remained in the dubious condition in which herschel had left them at last on october twenty fourth eighteen fifty one after some years of fruitless watching lascelles espied ariel and umbriel two uranian attendants interior to oberon and titania and of about half their brightness so that their disclosure is still reckoned amongst the very highest proofs of instrumental power and perfection in all probability they were then for the first time seen for although professor holden made out a plausible case in favour of the fitful visibility to herschel of each of them in turn lascelles argument that the glare of the planet in herschel's great specula must have rendered almost impossible the perception of objects so minute and so close to its disc appears tolerably decisive to the contrary uranus is thus attended by four moons and so far as present knowledge extends by no more among the most important of the negative results secured by lascelles observations at malta during the years eighteen fifty two to fifty three and eighteen sixty one to sixty five were the convincing evidence afforded by them that without great increase of optical power no further neptunian or uranian satellites can be perceived and the consequent relegation of herschel's baffling quartet notwithstanding the unquestioned place long assigned to them in astronomical textbooks 
to the nirvana of non-existence chapter four